Thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate it. And I really appreciate Mayor Amadon and um, Taffy and the DAR and the Historical Society. I've got to spend a little time with them today at lunch and they're just delightful people. You're very blessed to have such a great mayor and a group of women in your community. And uh, I really love this idea of the Diocese Langston Monument. It's, it's exciting to me and I love that she's in motion. I love that you did that because uh, when I think of Dicey, I think of, you know, this expert rider. She was a good shot, you know, she was an expert rifle woman. And she, you know, nothing stopped her. She was just larger than life, even though she was probably a shorter person than you might think. So anyway, I want to talk a little bit about why I wrote the book to start with, and then we'll get into some of the stories that I know are factual. So when you write a book like this, you're, you know, it's kind of, an undertaking. I was telling my husband, he goes, you seem a little more nervous before you're speaking than you normally do. And I'm like, well, I'm not really nervous. It's just this sense of responsibility to my fourth grade grandmother. You know, it's, it's not like just I'm talking about my own ideas or concepts. I'm talking about somebody who really impacted more lives than we probably will ever, ever know for good. And so um, my first encounter with Dicey was as a young woman, uh, I was probably 12, 13, 14 years old. And my mother made me this book of remembrance that had genealogy and ancestors in it and had stories. And there was the story of Dicey Langston in there. There was one lady who had done an account that was as accurate probably as anyone's. And it's shared about seven different little vignettes that were passed down about Dicey. And I was just mesmerized by this story as a young woman and especially because she was born May 14th of 1766 and I was born May 1st of 1966. So we were just 200 years apart. And so we kind of, she got married younger than I did, but we kind of had children at the similar time periods and things. And it was just this parallel trailing uh, story of 200 years ago with my story. And so I always had kind of in the back of my mind, I'd love to do something with this story. I don't know exactly, but I got into writing in about, I don't know, 1995, 1996, but I was writing nonfiction at the time. And uh, my publisher, distributor, uh, was distributing my nonfiction, uh, Christian books. They came to me and they said, have you ever thought about writing fiction at all? And I'm like, well, you know, I might try it. I don't, you know, I don't know. But I had a good friend who wrote fiction and she kind of tutored me a little bit. And I pitched them this idea because they wanted to do a clean romance series. And I, was, I had, there's multiple accounts of this one time when some of these men come to get a rifle from Dicey that James, her brother, has left with um, her to be picked up. And there's a password, you know. Anyway, it's a cute little story. And some people, the, the lady that I, her account that I read, it was Thomas Springfield who came to get the rifle. And other people, they don't mention that it was him, but I, I really thought this is a fun little romance, you know, and there was a, kind of this story that, you know, that's how they met and he kept coming back and coming back until he talked her into marrying him kind of thing. And so uh, I pitched the story to my publisher and they were like, oh yeah, write it, write it. But then they, after I got it done, I, they just sort of shelved their whole idea for about two or three, four years or something. And I'm like, I want to get this done. So I went ahead and, and got the book done and they distributed it. But so that's why you've got a little bit of more romance element to this story than you might think, because you're, you're probably picking up and you go, I'm going to just read this historical thing. But it's kind of got, you know, a little cheesy romance going in there a little bit, you know, because it was my first novel. And uh, and anyway, but people seem to to like Dicey either way. And it makes her a little bit more human, a little bit more relatable because she's, she is a 15 or 16 year old girl, you know, and 15 or 16 year old girls, you know, they still have a little bit of romance in them. Right. So that's kind of how I got into this. And they asked me, the DAR, Taffy and the DAR asked me to talk about the importance of female patriots. And I started thinking about myself, you know, and am I living up to the legacy that Dicey has, you know, and, and sometimes I'm like, well, sometimes I feel like I am and sometimes not so much. 
And so I started thinking of the stories about Dicey that have been gone through, carried down and everything. And what can they teach me about being a patriot today? So not just, I know there's men in here too. So men, women, we can all be patriots like Dicey. And what can we learn from her stories? So as a young girl in Lawrence, South Carolina, let me just give you a little idea of the setting here. She's come from North Carolina as a young woman with her family. And she's come into kind of a nest of people who are for the Tories or they're Tories and they're for the British, right? They don't want to separate from England and they're very pro Britain. And most of the people, even some of the relatives around her, they're all for the British. And so her family is the oddballs. Okay. <laughs> they're the, the rebels. They're the ones that others are like, you know, those Langston's, you know, they're, you know, wanting to, they think General Washington to actually do something, you know, they're kind of not agreeing with them at all. And also you've got a setting of um, women of the time were basically kind of like, you know, oh yeah, a, a kid, you know, like, so Dicey's not only got discounted as she's a kid, but also she's a young woman. So they're not paying attention to her if they're in their parties and they're talking about what their plans are, like we're going to go attack this place or we're going to steal this person's horses or whatever. They're not listening. I mean, they're not noticing that Dicey's there because she's a young woman and she's also a kid. So they just, she started to hear things and she would be like, huh, <laughs> you know, they're going to attack this place. And you know, my brother uh, knows those people or, you know, she had two brothers who served, in for the patriot cause her father served until he was injured and some accounts make him sound like he's an infirm old man but he was just he was wounded but he was probably i don't know 40s or 50s he wasn't really that old really but he you know of course had taught his children to be patriotic and there's a langston baptist church that was formed he donated donated the land for that so they were very religious people devout people they um they had a strong faith and a strong value system and solomon and his wife trained his children their children to love their country and to uh, stand up for freedom and they believed that where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty you know so there's this um setting that dicey's coming from now dicey was also in um a time period when you've almost got a civil war within a revolutionary war because these people whether they were for the tories or the whigs they they were fighting with each other and they would use it the war as an excuse to like go into somebody's house and take their stuff you know like oh i like that guy's art i'll go get it or i like that person's horse i'll go steal it you know and so they were basically looting each other you know if you were on the opposite side of the situation so you've got um, not only those people that what they call cowboys who are just basically using the war as an excuse to get what they want from other people or hurt other people or something but then you've got a more sinister group of people called the bloody scouts and the bloody scouts were led by a man named bill cunningham and um when i was researching the book i read some different accounts and they would be like okay uh you know it would be like a, a bunch of women from that time period and they'd say well okay so dicey threw herself in front of somebody you know she threw herself in front of a gun big deal no big i mean a lot of women did that a lot of women were spies she, you know she doesn't really stand out and me you know i'm going this is my fourth great grandmother she stands out <laughs> so i'm looking for it and so I was reading one of the accounts and it talks about how the bloody scouts came to Solomon Langston, her father, and said, you either take control of your feisty meddlesome daughter or we're going to take care of you. And so I did a search for who the bloody scouts are because I didn't know. Well, these guys were horrible. They were ruthless. They would take people and, you know, pull them out of their house, burn their houses down, take their stuff. Then they'd take them and string them up to a tree. And then they'd take their horses and run in around them and slice them, you know, up and dice them. These people, they were just horrifically horrible. They were called bloody scouts for a reason. 
So suddenly Dicey becomes lar a much bigger hero because, you know, any story you read, whether it's Harry Potter and Voldemort or whatever, Harry Potter is only great because of Voldemort, because Voldemort is so bad, right? You know, so your hero is only as strong as the villain. And now we've got the Bloody Scouts as the villain for Dicey Langston. And so she really stands out as somebody who is incredibly brave because she had this warning that if you don't stop what you're doing, we're going to destroy your family. And so she stopped for a while. But I want to take a moment and just ask you to think about what it is to stand up for freedom in a divided society. I think we can relate to that. Maybe not in your little town, maybe you don't have as much of the conflict, you know, but in the world itself, we have a very divided society. So as we go through these stories of Dicey and everything, maybe put yourself in the position of her you know, of what it's like now and what if you faced some of the things that she she faced and her family faced and ask yourself, you know, how can I apply what Dicey did to my situation? Because I think there's a lot of insights since we're living almost in a bit of a parallel time. Not exactly, but it's, we can relate. And also the, the point there that I wanted to make is that even while everybody else is losing their heads, the Langston family did not. And there are stories and accounts of that that I'll be sharing. They did not use it as an excuse to hurt other people. They were still kind to their neighbors. And I think that's important, an important lesson that we can learn. So they, they did not abandon their values just because everybody else around them did. I'm going to share a story with you. This is probably the centerpiece story of Dicey. There's some conflict over which river she crossed. I think in the book I have is the tiger. There's a gentleman, I believe, that the DAR is going to have speak uh, in a few more weeks. And he thinks it was the Ennery. Is that how you say it? Okay. So he thinks it was that one. And he thinks he knows where she crossed. So that's going to be cool for y'all to get to hear him. So there's this, this story of she's been warned. You know, her dad says, none of this, more, no more of this spying, none of this. So she stops. And then she overhears that this settlement at um, it's called the Elder Settlement at Little Eden, okay, is going to be attacked at dawn by the Bloody Scouts. Dicey kind of weighs the, you know, what is what am I going to do here? Her brother James is stationed at this Elder Settlement, and obviously she loves her brother. She doesn't want him to die, but she also doesn't want these settle the settlement to die. So she. Um, sets out in the middle of the night on foot and the river at the time is swollen beyond its banks. So evidently they had a lot of rain and everything and she's not a very tall girl. So she goes out and she gets into the water and she crosses a lot of terrain even to get there. Okay. The marshy areas and stuff like that. And when she gets there, she gets about to the middle and kind of loses her footing and she gets turned around, you know, where, which way is the right bank, you know? And so she, they say Providence helps her. Okay. So I'm saying, I'm thinking she said a little prayer. I would have, I would have said, please help me figure out which way to go. So she crosses on and ends up, it's the right side when she gets to the other side. She goes on to the settlement. She warns her brother James and the men have already been out on excursions. They're exhausted. It's late. It's in the middle of the night. They don't want to go have to move an entire settlement out. They just like, are you really, do we have to do this? And James trusts Dicey and he's, you know, if Dicey heard it, we're going to do this. They're hungry. They're tired. So she says, well, bring me, let's get a fire going. Bring me what you got. I'll make you something. So she makes them some hoe cakes. It cooks them as fast as she can. They're kind of still gooey, but they take them and they put them in the shop pouch and, and the guys clear out the village, warn everybody, get them out. Dicey goes back to her home, goes back across the river and gets home in time to make her dad's breakfast without him being any of the wiser. And of course, when the bloody scouts arrive, there's nobody there. 
So when you think about what we owe to Dicey, how many of you are descendants of Dicey in the room? I know a lot of you have been telling me. Okay, so there's quite a few of us. All right. There's a lot. They write me a lot of times. So not only do we owe our existence to this 15, 16-year-old girl, but to everybody who descended from that elder settlement do, do as well. And we don't even know who those people are, right? I mean, there's just a huge impact, all from the choice to act. Because she could have just said, well, my dad said I can't do it, and, and I'm not advocating to any young people to just go against your <laughs> parents' will. <laughs> but, you know, in this case, I believe she was inspired to do what she did. So act with courage is an, a good point for each of us to be in being patriotic. And then um, her brother James obviously entrusted her with a lot of things. He believed in her. And so there was a rifle that he wanted delivered to somebody. They were going to come pick it up. Some, um, some of the patriots were going to come and pick up this rifle from Dyson. He said, but don't just give it to anybody here because anybody can come and pretend that they want something so i'll give you a password and they'll give you the password and everything i i say this you know be of service in your daily life uh as she was of service to the cause of freedom and she she could be trusted to help in the cause of freedom but this is where we get that kind of fun story here when they the, they come to pick up the gun you know, they, they knock, they say, you know, we're here to pick up the rifle that James left for us. And she's like, oh, okay. She lets them in. She goes upstairs to get the rifle and she comes down and then she's like, wait a minute, I forgot to ask for the password. Right. So she's, she says, okay, what's the countersign? What's the password? And Thomas Springfield is the one who answers and he's like, I don't need a password. I've already got the gun and you, you know, what do I need a password for? You're right here. And so she levels the gun at him and says, well, take it if you dare, you know. <laughs> and so he just like gets a little nervous and, and gives her the password. Uh, in the book, I make it, she's a little too enamored with how cute Thomas Springfield is. <laughs> so that's why she forgets the password, because I'm thinking, Dicey doesn't forget to ask for a password. She's a little bit enamored by this boy that shows up at her door. So. I was talking to the gentleman who's going to speak in a few weeks, and I hate to throw him under the bus, but he doesn't think this story's real, but I think it's real, and I'll tell you why I think it's real. Okay, so there's a story about how some Whigs show up. Now, so the Whigs are rebels. They're, they're for the Patriots. They show up at Solomon Langston talking to him in his study, and they reveal that they're going to steal a neighbor's horses because they want like the stallion that this guy's got, right? So, and Solomon Langston, being the good man that he is, he's like, this neighbor is a good man. He's peaceful. He doesn't, he's not one of these out here looting anybody. He's not trying to hurt anybody. We know him. He's a good guy. He may not believe what we believe, but he's still a good guy. And so he gets Dicey to go and warn this man that his horses are going to be stolen. And so Dicey warns the man. And then on the way back, uh, well, before on the way back, while she's there, she overhears that this neighbor rounds up some men and they go, yeah, we're going to lay in wait and we're going to kill them when they show up to get my horses because enough of this nonsense. We're not Because really the good guys and we say good guys, the Patriots and the and the Tories, they both did bad stuff. They Some of them were bad and would steal from each other either way. And so this guy's like, enough of this. We're going to take care of it. Well, then Dicey's like, well, I can't have the Patriot guys getting killed. So she doubles back and warns the Patriot guys that, hey, they're laying in wait for you about this horse. So she, this idea of being kind and respectful of everyone, whether they believe the way you do or not, I think she would do that. I mean, that's who she is to me. So, I mean, you could say, oh, she would never warn the enemy. But I think she would. I think they were... Um, they were people that honored life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, and they honored their God. And so I think they, they would have stood up and said, you know, we're not going to act this way. So that's um, another element there is to show kindness even to one's enemies. 
there's another story of where uh, the bloody stick outs show up to the Langston home and they're ready to take out all of the Langston men. They want to get rid of them all. James, Solomon, Junior, Solomon. And they show up, but the, the, bro the boys are not there, just the father. And so they're going to kill him. And they come to him in his study and they're, they're going to kill him and they're threatening him. And, and Solomon's trying to, oh, wait a minute now, you know, <laughs> let's don't, let's don't do this. And, and Dicey comes in and throws herself in front of her dad and says, no, well, you're not going to do, you're going to have to shoot through me. And they threaten, they're like, well, this bullet can go through you. We don't care. We'll shoot you too. But because of her bravery and, and her insistence, well, you're just going to have to shoot me they leave and it says they leave with admiration for their the filial affection you know the that family affection that she would do that for her dad so protecting our families i think is important the family itself i think is under attack and i think that is something that we can do as patriots to stand up for the family another couple stories I don't know about you, but sometimes if I'm dealing with a lot of problems, I just kind of want to stick my head in the sand and pray they go away, you know, and not really deal with them head on. But I think Dicey ha handled things head on. And there's two accounts of this that I'll share with you. One of them is where the, some men came to the door and they were trying to get into the house and everything. And she stood on the other side of the door with her rifle and and threatened them off like I'm I'm going to shoot you through the door I can shoot through the door if I have to to get rid of you you know and and she did it so with such strength that they were scared and they just left they they wouldn't face her that way there's another one where she's carrying a message to the patriots and she's taken somebody gets her and they're like, we know who you are. We, you, we know you are the D daring Dicey Langston, and you're carrying a message, and we want to know what it is. You're going to tell us what it is. And she refuses and tells them, you know, they just have to kill her. And so they're prepared to. And, and it says she takes this white handkerchief, and she opens it up in front of herself as if she's giving a place for the contents of the weapon to be discharged in this, you know, like, shoot me, here's the bullseye. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And one of the one of the guys goes to shoot and another one takes pity on her and knocks the man's arm in the air and the gun goes off and in the kind of the fray she's able to escape and get away. So I've thought a lot about those two situations and thought, okay, how can I face things head on, you know, rather than just kind of hoping problems go away? How can you address them with strength of character? And, and deal with them. And I think sometimes in our society today, facing ch challenges head on may have to do with, you've got conflicts going on with family members or friends or something, and we just want to kind of ghost people and not deal with it. But maybe w being willing to have the conversations and make peace is a way of facing our problems head on today. Because I think she would have done that. I don't think she would have just, you know, let problems simmer over here and not address them. The other, the last tip from Dicey is to leave a patriotic posterity. Now, I realize you can't make your children be patriots, but because I've got some and some of them are and some of them don't really care. <laughs> so, but you can teach them, you know, we can teach them correct principles and we can be good role models for them. And Dicey ended up having, um, one obituary says, I think Thomas has said 21 children and Dicey said 22, but I don't think any, uh, only 15 of them we know live to adulthood. So the others, some of them didn't even make it into the family Bible, but she evidently had miscarriages and she counted them. She counted her children. She left this posterity of people that across time they have been, they fought in almost every major war. The descendants of Dicey Langston have. They've been uh, patriots throughout time, and I don't. I don't know why I'm a. I mean, my dad is a hardcore patriot, so I always say my dad taught me freedom and stuff. But um, I think it's the legacy of Dicey. I think it. Uh, would you say that, Karen? You're my cousin. It's. It goes. It's in that. I don't know any uh, non 
freedom loving Springfields. <laughs> she said sometime toward the end of her life that she was proud to have 32 sons and grandsons who could take up arms in defense of their liberty. And she ended up having, I think at the time of her death, she had 140 grandchildren and great grandchildren, the obituary said. So, I mean, that's a huge posterity <laughs> to leave a legacy. And um, uh, this, this book here, I have this uh, Springfield book, and it talks about how um, Thomas and Dicey's descendants and the different wars that they served in and things there. And I think there's one thing I wanted to bring out as I was pondering on this, just in <clears throat> final wrapping up, is that patriotism is more than fighting for liberty. I think it's how we hold to our values of freedom and honor and integrity and kindness and how we treat other people. Because this country was founded on like a God-fearing premise, you know, that we are all created in the image of our maker and that we're here to, you know, he created us on equal ground, you know, and what we do with our lives from here, that's our choice of what we do. And so I think how we protect those values while we can protect those values is patriotism. And uh, thank you. I appreciate your opportunity to come and talk to y'all. And um, so anyway, uh, did you want to have questions or do you? Yeah. Delaney, you got a question? Go ahead, stand up. Um, how many books are there? Of, I made one book on Dicey. I have some other books about Dicey's descendants, different ones, but there's one about Dicey. Good question. Thank you. Uh, do you have, so um, if I'm correct, from what I've heard, the cabin in this area, Spring, do you, are you familiar with that? Was it on um, Tigerville Road? I think so, yeah. That's where her, at least that's not where all of her Revolutionary War escapades, but that's where she lived with Thomas. Yeah. And these pictures here, I think I've got. Yeah, that's where she lived when she died, right there, that cabin. And then that's a picture of the Thomas Springfield home <clears throat> as well. So it's probably the same house, just whether it's the side or the. Yeah, we went to the, that's where he's talking about on Tigerville, <clears throat> that monument across from the Ennery Ch uh, Baptist Church. 